Hello everyone, I am Shikha, brought to you a new chapter from the Literature Reader, New Broadway. Hello my all dear student of class 8, Shikha has brought you a new chapter from the book, New Broadway, Literature Reader, The Miracle Merchant. Let's start the chapter. Some information about the writer. Saki was the pan name of Hector Hughes Munro, born in 1870 and died in 1916, a well-known English political satirist, novelist, a story writer and a dramatist. Specializing in short stories, Munro developed a brilliantly witty style based on his favorite dramatist Oscar Wilde. The Miracle Merchant is Saki's dramatized version of his own short story called The Han. So uh, Saki has put a pan name. Pan name means uh, we can say the writer uh, doesn't want to be known with the uh, exact or official name and that's why he or she uh, keeps uh, her favorite name okay his or her favorite name by which uh, they want uh, to be known for their writing all right and uh, he was really inspired by Oscar Wilde Oscar Wilde was one of the very famous Irish uh, poets and uh, playwrights all right and uh, there is one short story a novel we can say the hand and this is the part of that short story collection so uh, the hand is a book where number of the short stories are there and this is one of the short story in the form of the chapter the miracle merchant in this humorous play a miracle merchant promises to supply a miracle what is the miracle does he succeed merchant means businessman and humorous is called funny or logical so it's a play means we have characters of the play uh, with statement or dialogues one of its character is miracle businessman who promised to show a miracle now what is the miracle who are the other characters does he succeed uh, in his promises or not uh, this all we'll see when uh, we'll move on to the chapter first we know the characters of the play so uh, the characters are mrs bew whistle lois Cosset, her nephew uh, nephew is called Batija. Jane Martlet, who is a guest in the play, uh, Sturridge, who is Mrs. Bewhistle's butler, and a page boy, um, who was the attendant of uh, Jane Martlet. Now we formally proceed to the story. Here are some new words from the text that will help you while explaining the chapter. Holcomb sitting room in Mrs. Bewhistle's country house, French window right. Doors right center and mid center, staircase left center, door left, long table center of the stage towards footlights set with breakfast service, chairs at table, writing table and chair right of the stage, a small hall table back of stage, wooden paneling below staircase hung with swords, daggers, etc. In view of audience, stand with golf clubs, etc. left. So here uh, the play starts with the scene of Mrs. Bewhistle's country house hall come sitting room. Country house, uh, we can say a large house with a stretched length. French window is that serves as a window and a door as well. So in this paragraph, we'll see the scene setting. On the right side of the hall, there is a French window, a door in the center. A staircase is towards left side with door. In the center of the stage, there is a long table. Towards the footlights is breakfast service. Table is surrounded with chairs. At the right side of the stage, there is a writing table and chair. At the back side of the stage, there is a small table. Below the staircase, on the wooden panel, dagger, swords and uh, other fighting tools are hung that are visible to audience towards the left side of the stage there is a stand with golf clubs etc mrs bew whistle seated at writing table she was had her breakfast enter lois down staircase lois good morning aunt he inspects the breakfast dishes mrs bew whistle good morning lois Mrs. Uh, Bew Whistle, after having a breakfast, seated at the writing chair, and Louis entered downstairs. He wishes Mrs. Bew Whistle good morning and by addressing her aunt, and then saw the breakfast table. Mrs. Bew Whistle also wished him back good morning. Louis, where is Miss Martlett? Helps himself from a dish. Mrs. Bew Whistle, 
she finished her breakfast a moment ago. Lois sits down. I'm glad we are alone. I wanted to ask you. Enter Sturridge left with coffee, which he places on the table and withdraws. I wanted to ask you. So Lois uh, took his breakfast and asked about Miss Smartlet. Then Mrs. Bewissel replied that she had just finished her breakfast. So Lois sat down and conveyed his gladness on being alone with Mrs. Bewissel. He wanted to ask something. Meanwhile, uh, Mrs. Bewissel's butler named Sturridge entered from left side, put coffee on the table and went away. Mrs. Bewissel, whether I could lend you twenty pounds, I suppose. Lois, as a matter of fact, I was only going to ask for fifteen. Perhaps twenty would sound better. Mrs. Bewissel, the answer is the same in either case, and it's no. I couldn't even lend you five. You see, I have had extra expenses just lately. So Mrs. Bewissel guessed about giving twenty pounds to him, uh, and Lois uh, answered that in fact he was in need of fifteen pounds, but twenty would be better. Mrs. Bewissel told that whatever would be the amount, she could not lend him even five pounds. She informed that she already had much expenses right now. Lois, my dear aunt, please don't give reasons. A charming woman should always be unreasonable. It's part of her charm. Just say, Lois, I love you very much, but I'm damned if I lend you any more money. I should understand perfectly. Mrs. Bewissel, well, we'll take it as sad. I have just had a letter from Dora Pithos to say she's coming on Thursday. So Lois told his uh, dear aunt not to give reasons. He addressed her charming and uh, flattered that a charming woman should be uncooperative as it enhances her beauty. And then uh, he insisted upon saying uh, that Mrs. Bewissel should told him that uh, she loved him very much. But she should be uh, regarded as a bad woman if uh, she lent more money to him. And then Lois told that uh, he would understand perfectly. So here Lois was saying to Mrs. Bewissel that in what manner she should deny for not lending uh, him more money. Mrs. Bewissel told that uh, they would do as decided earlier. Then she informed him that uh, she had a letter to know um, about that uh, through the letter she came to know that Dora Bithols was coming on Thursday. Lois, this next Thursday, I say, that's rather awkward, isn't it? Mrs. Bewissel, why awkward? Lois, Jane Martlet has only been here six days and she never stays less than a fortnight. Even when she has asked definitely for a week, you will never get her out of the house by Thursday. So Lois wondered and found it uh, cumbersome that the arrival of Dora uh, on very next Thursday. Mrs. Bubisil asked that uh, what he found inconvenient in it. Then Lois replied that uh, Jane Martlet had been there for six days, but she never stayed uh, less than 15 days. Fortnight is called 15 days. Even if she had asked for a week, means Jane Martlet, who was a guest of Mrs. Bubisil, would never stay for a short period of time. And like this, Mrs. Bubisil would not be able to take her out of the house by coming Thursday. Here, Lois wanted to tell that Dora Bithos was about to come on coming Thursday and Jane Martlet was already there in the house, right? And she would never leave the house before Dora's arrival if Mrs. Bubisil would ask Jane Martlet to leave even then. Mrs. Bewissel, but why should I? She and Dora are good friends, aren't they? They used to be. Lois, used to be, yes. That is what makes them such bitter enemies now. Mrs. Bewissel, but why are they enemies? What have they quarreled about? Some uh, men, I suppose? Uh, so, Mrs. Bewissel replied that why would she tell Jane to go from the house as Jane and Dora were good friends and then she uh, confirmed from Lois and told that Jane and Dora used to be good friends. Lois agreed that uh, they used to be good friends but uh, something is there what made them bitter enemies now. Mrs. Bewissel asked why were they enemies and why they had fought. Then she made a guess that uh, there could be a man behind this quarrel. 
Louis, no, a hand has come between them. Mrs. Beauvisel, a hand, what hand? Louis, it was a bronze ligon or some such exotic breed and Dora sold it to Jane at a rather exotic price. They both go in for poultry breeding, you know. Mrs. Beauvisel, if Jane agreed to give the prize, I don't see what there was to quarrel about. Louis uh, is informing that not a man but uh, a hand had come in between. Uh, here, uh, let me tell you, there is a phrase go in for. So, this means uh, take part, and Legon is a kind of breed of hand. So, Mrs. Bew whistle surprisingly asked about the hand, and uh, Louis told that uh, there was a bronze uh, color hen of Legon breed, and Dora had sold that hand to Jane at a very good price. Then they both prepared for poultry breeding and uh, Mrs. Bubisel asked if Jane had agreed to give the amount for the bronze hen. Then what was the issue? Here we see that Dora had sold one bronze hand uh, to Jane and Jane purchased it in exchange of the asked price. Louis, well, you see, the bird did not lay eggs, and I'm told that angry letters were exchanged. Mrs. Bubisil, how ridiculous. Couldn't some of their friends compose the quarrel? Louis, it would have been rather like composing the stone music of a Wagner opera. Jane was willing to take back some of her remark if Dora would take back the hand. Then uh, uh, ridiculous means absurd or we can say funny. So Lois informed that uh, the hen not used to lay eggs. And uh, I came to know that they both had some argument about it. Mrs. Bubisel exclaimed in an absurd manner and asked if some of their friends uh, created the quarrel. Lois told that it would have been like composing the stomy of vibrant music like an opera of Wagner. Uh, let me tell you about Wegner, uh, who was, um, uh, his full name was Richard Wegner, who was born in 1813 and died in 1883. He was a German composer, uh, famous for his opera. Now, opera is a kind of singing in which the words are sung in a conversing manner, in a dramatic compositions with music. So, Lewis was comparing the quarrel between Jane and Dora with opera. He further told that Jane was ready to take some of her remarks back if uh, Dora uh, wouldn't take in uh, that Legon hand back. Means Jane was not happy on that purchase of that Legon hand. Mrs. Beauvisel, and wouldn't she, Louis, not she, she said that uh, would be owning herself in the wrong and you know that Dora would never under any circumstances own herself in the wrong. Mrs. Bubisil, it will be a most awkward situation having them both under my roof at the same time. Do you suppose they won't speak to one another? Uh, Mrs. Bubisil asked if Dora uh, took that hand back or not. Louis denied and said that Dora told that it would be wrong if she took the hand uh, uh, hand back like this. And uh, Dora was not a kind of a person who could be a part of any unfair situation. Whatever the situation might be, Dora had already sold that hand and she could not take her back now like this. So, Louis made it very clear to Mrs. Bubisil that... Uh, Though Jane told uh, Dora to take the hand back, but Dora found it wrong and uh, didn't take the hand back. Mrs. Bubisil put her opinion by saying that it would be the most absurd situation then to have Dora and Jane under her roof at the same time. Then she asked Louis if he supposed they wouldn't talk to each other. Now Mrs. Bubisil had all, uh, also understood the situation. Lois, on the contrary, the difficulty will be to get them to leave off. Mrs. Bubisil, what is to be done? I can't put Dora off. I've already postponed her visit once and nothing short of a miracle would make Jane leave before her self-allotted fortnight is over. So, Lois replied that uh, the opposite situation would be more difficult when um, uh, would tell them to go away. Mrs. Bubisil assured her concern by saying what to be done in that case. 
case. She informed that uh, she couldn't tell Dora to go again as uh, she once had already postponed her visit and on the other side Jane would not uh, go before her self-decided stay of 15 days uh, would get over. Now only a miracle could let her to leave before 15 days else uh, she uh, wouldn't go. So we see here that Mrs. Bewistle was really stressed and confused that what would happen when Dora and Jane both would be at her home as uh, they both had argument earlier. Lois, I don't mind trying to supply a miracle at short notice. Miracles are rather in my line. Mrs. Beauvisel, my dear Lois, you will be clever if you get Jane out of the house before Thursday. Lois, I shall not only be clever, I shall be rich in sheer gratitude. You will say to me, Lois, I love you more than ever. And here are the 20 pounds we were speaking about. So now here, Lois consoled Mrs. Beauvisel by saying, that uh, he would try to create some kind of uh, magic uh, even at the short notice. So as uh, creating the miracles were the part of his life. So Mrs. Bubisil addressed him dear and told in a flattering manner that he would be cleverer if he would get Jane out of the house before Thursday. At this, Lewis told that uh, he should not only show his cleverness, but he should be rich as well as uh, Mrs. Bubisil would uh, say to him that um, uh, she loves him a lot and uh, it would uh, and she also would keep 20 pounds for him, which they had a talk about. So Lewis now got a chance to get 20 pounds from Mrs. Bubisil as she was in trouble and Lewis took the benefit of the situation by asking him to hand over 20 pounds in exchange of helping her. And to Jane Door Center. Jane, good morning, Lewis. Lewis, rising. Good morning, Jane. Jane, go on with your breakfast. I have had mine, but I'll just have a cup of coffee to keep you company. Helps herself. Is there any toast left? Lewis, storage is bringing some. Here it comes. At that time, uh, from center door, Jane entered and uh, wished Lois good morning. Lois stood up and wished her back. Uh, Jane told him to continue with his breakfast and uh, told that she had hers. But uh, she wouldn't mind to have a cup of coffee to accompany him. She took coffee uh, and uh, uh, asked for toast if uh, any had left over there. So Lois told that storage was bringing more toast. Sturridge enters left with toast rack. Jane seats herself and is helped to the toast. She takes three pieces. Jane, isn't uh, there any butter? Sturridge, your sleeve is in the butter, miss. Jane, oh yes, helps herself generously. Exit Sturridge left. So meanwhile, Sturridge entered from left side with toast rack. Jane sat down and took three pieces of toast. Jane asked if there was butter available. Then Sturridge informed that uh, there was butter um, under uh, her sleeve, means under one arm. She saw and helped herself to take the butter. Sturridge went away from left. So we see that uh, Jane entered and even after having the breakfast, didn't mind to have it again with Louis. Mrs. Bewissel, Jane Deer, I see the Mackenzie Hubbard wedding is on Thursday next. St. Peter's is on Square, such a pretty church for weddings. I suppose you will be wanting to run away from us to attend it. You were always such a friends with Louisa Hubbard. It would hardly do for you not to turn up. Mrs. Bewissel told Jane that uh, the planned wedding of uh, uh, Mackenzie Hubbard was on coming Thursday. The venue for wedding was a pretty church named St. Peter's Eton Square. Mrs. Bubisil guessed that Jane would definitely want to rush for that wedding as uh, she had been a very good friend of Louisa Hubbard. So it wouldn't be possible that she would not attend her friend's wedding. Jane, oh, I'm not going to bother to go all that way for a silly wedding. Much as I like Louisa, I shall go and stay with her for several weeks after she has come back from her honeymoon. Louis grins across at his aunt. I don't see any honey. 
Here, grins means to smile, uh, showing teeth. Jin told that uh, she would not trouble herself to attend that silly wedding. She told that uh, she likes Luisa and uh, she would definitely go and have a stay with Luisa for many weeks when she would be back from her honeymoon. Lois uh, uh, smiled looking at Mrs. Beauvisel at Jane's remark. Now, Jane's now wanted honey with toast. Jane, oh, I see. Can I have some more hot milk? This is nearly cold. Sturridge takes jug and exit left. Louis looks fixedly after him, seats himself near Jane and stares solemnly at the floor. Louis, servants are a bit of a nuisance. Uh, when Sturridge was about to go, then Jane demanded more hot milk as the earlier one got cold. Uh, Sturridge took the jug and exited from left side. Louis kept on staring Sturridge going and uh, then sat beside uh, Jane and kept staring at the floor. He was looking serious. He told that servants are a trouble. Jane, servants are nuisance? I should think they are. The trouble I have in getting suited, you would hardly believe. But I don't see what you have to complain of. Your aunt is so wonderfully lucky in her servants. Sturridge, for instance, he has been with her for years and I'm sure he is a jewel as butlers go. Jane first surprised and uh, later agreed with Lois that uh, she would also think uh, same about the servants. She told that Lois might not agree to it, but the difficulty with her was in adjusting. But she was unable to understand why Lois had complained as uh, Mrs. Bubisil was very lucky to have such good servants at her home. For example, Esteridge had been with her for years and he was a jewel as a butler. Means Esteridge was really extraordinary in service for Mrs. Bubisil. Lois, that's just the trouble. It's when servants have been with you for years that they become a really serious nuisance. The other sort, uh, the here today and uh, gone tomorrow lot, don't matter. You are simply got to replace them. Jane, but if they give satisfaction... So Lois told uh, that it's a trouble, in fact, because when servants had been working for years, they became a real burden. The other kind uh, that uh, they are there that day and gone away the following day. But this all simply didn't matter as finally we had to replace them. Means uh, Lois wanted to say that servants are uh, here today, but uh, they could go tomorrow anywhere else. Then Jane asked if they uh, made us satisfied with their work that and what to say? Lois, that doesn't prevent them from giving trouble. As it happens, I was particularly thinking of storage when I made the remark about servants being a nuisance. Jane, the excellent storage a nuisance? I can't believe it. Lois, I know he is excellent and my aunt simply couldn't get along without him. But his very excellence has had an effect on him. Jane, what effect? So, uh, Lewis replied that if they gave satisfaction, even then, uh, the servants proved trouble and it happens. He told that he was especially thinking about his storage uh, when he made the remark about inconvenience caused by servants. Jane opposed and couldn't believe on his remark of uh, uh, believing his storage as a trouble. According to her, his storage was well trained. Now, Louis agreed that Esteridge was a very good servant and his aunt couldn't do anything without him, but his excellent service had an effect on him. Then Jane asked about the kind of effect uh, he was talking about. Louis, solemnly, have you ever considered what it must be like to go on doing the correct thing in the correct manner in the same surroundings for the greater part of a lifetime? Jane, with conviction, I should go mad. Ex Louis, exactly mad. Conviction means a strong belief in something. So, Louis told in a serious manner that if she had ever thought what would be um, if uh, one keeps on doing all the actions in a right manner in the same environment for a long period of time uh, of his or her life. So Jane told with a strong belief that she would go mad after listening to all these philosophical thoughts of Lois. Lois agreed by saying yes, exactly mad.
enters storage left with milk jug which he places on the table and exits left. Jane, but Sturridge hasn't gone mad, Lewis. On most points, uh, he's thoroughly sane and reliable. But at the times, he is subject to the most obstinate delusions. Uh, delusions means a uh, false belief or a sign of madness. An obstinate is called a uh, haughty or stubborn, ziddi situation, right? So um, here, that time storage entered from left side with the jug of milk and uh, kept that on the table and went out from left side. Jane took Lois' remark as if he had said mad about storage and said that storage hadn't gone mad or seemed. Lois told that most of the time he behaved as if he was sensible and trustworthy. But sometimes he showed very rigid false beliefs as if he was mad. Jane, delusion. What sort of delusion? She helps herself to more coffee. Lewis, unfortunately, they usually sent around someone staying in the house. That is where the awkwardness come in. For instance, he took it into his head that Matilda Sheringham, who was here last summer, was the prophet Eliza. Jane, the prophet Eliza, the man who was fed by Robin. Eliza, a prophet uh, who lived in 19th century BC and mentioned in the Old Testament. And Robin here has come for a big black crow. So Jane asked what kind of false belief while have someone uh, uh, more coffee, while she was having more coffee. Lewis said that unluckily these kind of servants kept on circling around the one who stayed in the house and that seemed really inconvenient. He gave an example of Matilda Sheringham who had a stay there last summer and Sturridge understood that uh, she was the prophet of 19th century. At this Jane confirmed if he he was the same man uh, who was eaten up by Raven uh, Lewis was talking about. Lewis, yes, it was the Ravens that particularly impressed Sturridge's imagination. He was rather offended, it seems, at the idea that Matilda should have her private catering arrangements. He wouldn't allow any tea to be sent up to her in the morning and when he waited at table, he passed her over altogether in handling round the dishes. Poor Matilda could scarcely get anything to eat. So Lewis said it right that was Robin about whom Sturridge thought uh, were uh, awakened. It seemed as if Sturridge attacked uh, at an idea that Matilda should make the arrangements of her food and drinks herself during her stay in that house. He uh, would never send morning tea to Matilda and on the dining table, he passed over many dishes at once to her. Pitiful Matilda could hardly get anything to eat. Means according to Louis, Sturridge kept on uh, creating troubles for Matilda. He never served her morning tea and uh, during meal time also, he created problems for her by passing many dishes at the same time in a group to her and uh, other persons as well so she was not able to eat anything properly jane how horrible how very horrible whatever did you do lois it was judged best for her to cut a visit short with emphasis in a case of that kind it was the only thing to be done jane i shouldn't have done that cuts herself some bread and butters it i should have hammered him in some way i certainly shouldn't have gone away Hamot here means agreed with servant and servant here is sisterish, right? So Jane exclaimed with surprise and reacted on it as a being terrible thing and then asked what he had done next. Then Louis told that it was decided uh, that Matilda's visit uh, should be kept short and uh, he put more emphasis on uh, this uh, that this was the only decision that could be taken at that time. Jane then told uh, in the uh, that case she shouldn't repeat the same. At the same time she sliced some bread and spread butter on it. Further, she said she would uh, be agree with Sturridge in spite of finding him unreasonable so uh, that Sturridge wouldn't have any complaint. Then she said uh, that uh, she shouldn't have made her visit um, shorter. So we find that Lois was in fact trying to convince Jane by telling a fake story. So uh, she would decide to leave the house early.
no it's it's not always wise to humor people when they get these ideas into their heads there is no knowing to what lengths they might go jane you don't mean to say storage might be dangerous louis one can never be certain now and then he gets some ideas about a guest which might take an unfortunate turn that is what is worrying me at the present moment so louis said that uh, it is not always wise to agree with the people when they have uh, such type of ideas in their minds because it's very hard to say that uh, how far uh, those kind of people can go for their purpose jane again confirmed uh, if he meant to say that storage might be proved dangerous for her then louis told that one could never be sure about that any time he got an idea about any guest that could be proved unlucky for that particular guest then he said that it was the thing uh, what was making him worried at that particular moment jane excitedly why has he taken some fancy about me louis who has taken a putter out of the stand left and is polishing with some oil rag he has jane no really who on earth does he think i am louis queen in jane queen in what an idea but anyhow there is nothing dangerous about her she is such a colorless personality no one could feel very strongly about queen in colorless personality here means pale or ill and a putter is the club for uh, uh, stroking a golf ball towards a hole so we can say it's a kind of a stick right so jane asked louis in uh, excitement why storage had taken any kind of imagination about her that time louis had taken a putter from the stand uh, kept on the left side and started polishing it uh, with an oiled old cloth and uh, said to jane that storage had some kind of imagination about her jane uh, denied and told that who was the person on this earth storage was thinking of me louis replied queen n jane uh, wondered on his remark by saying what an idea was as there was nothing dangerous about queen n because she herself was a person of very dull personality means there was nothing impressive so impressive in her personality that anyone could have any kind of impact of her so uh, we can say that anyhow louis just wanted to ensure uh, the departure of jane before coming thursday and so he was trying to convince her by telling different different incidents and fake stories Louis Stanley what does posterity chiefly say about her jane the only thing i can remember about her is the saying queen ends dead louis exactly dead jane do you mean that he takes me for the ghost of queen in a uh, posterity means a future generation here so now when louis uh, saw that jane was taking everything very lightly then he asked her being a uh, firm uh what the future generation mainly said about queen anne then jane replied that the only thing she could remember about uh, queen anne uh, was that queen anne was dead uh louis declared it right and uh, that she was dead then jane surprisingly asked if uh, he wanted to say that storage would thought of her as the ghost of queen anne Louis ghost do you know who ever heard of a ghost that come down to breakfast and at kidneys and toast and honey with a a uh, healthy appetite no it's the fact of you being so very much alive that perplexes and irritates him jane anxiously irritates him so here louis denied of ghost he told that uh, whoever would hear of a ghost he would think that the ghost would uh, come down for a breakfast and would eat kidney toast and honey on being hungry that's not true the fact was that jane was alive in disguise of a uh, queen in according to storage and uh, that thing made storage confused and troubled so jane confirmed by asking if uh, mine being alive would irritate uh, storage Louis yes all his life he has been accustomed to looking on queen in as dead and done with as dead as queen in you know and now he has to fill your glass at lunch and dinner and listen to your accounts of the gay time you had in a dublin horse show and naturally he feels that there is something wrong somewhere 
सो हियर अकस्टम्ड मीन हैबिचुअल एंड गे टाइम इज कॉल्ड एंजॉयबल एक्सपीरियंस लुइस टोल्ड दैट वॉज राइट एज फॉर स्टारेज क्वीन एन वॉज डैट बट नाउ ही वुड सी यू इन डिस गाइज ऑफ क्वीन एन एंड ही हैड टू सर्व यू एज इज गेस्ट बाय फिलिंग योर ग्लास ड्यूरिंग द मील टाइम एंड बिसाइड्स इट ही हैड टू लिसन टू योर इंसिडेंट्स एज वेल ऑफ डबलिन हॉर्स शो वेर यू हैड एन enjoyable time and then obviously he found something wrong uh, uh, somewhere um, as queen n was dead for a storage but now he was seeing her alive in you jane with increasing anxiety but he wouldn't be down right hostile to me on that account would he not violent louis carelessly i didn't get really alarmed about it till last night when he was bringing in the coffee i caught him scowling at you with a very threatening look and muttering things about you hostile is called unfriendly and uh, scowling here means looking in a very bad manner Uh, so Jane became worried and asked that Sturridge would not be unfriendly to her because of these things. She uh, confirmed and asked, uh, "Would he be aggressive towards her?" Uh, then Louis carelessly answered that he had not been aware about that till the previous night when Sturridge had brought coffee for her. He had seen him looking at her in the bad tempered way in an attacking look as well and he was murmuring something about her Jane what things Louis that you ought to be dead long ago and that someone should see you to it and that if no one else did he would cheerfully that's why i mentioned the matter to you Jane this is awful your aunt must be told about it at once Louis my aunt mustn't hear a word about it it would upset her dreadfully she realizes on his stories for everything um here jane asked him uh, what things sturridge was muttering about her then louis answered that according to sturridge uh, she uh, means queen anne should be dead long long before uh, and anyone in this house must look in this matter and proved it else uh, he himself would look into the matter and sort out uh, himself then he was looking happy while saying this uh, means louis was uh, looking very happy after saying this After sharing this, Louis told Jane that he knew about it, so he shared it. Jane exclaimed in irritation that his aunt uh, uh, should be aware about uh, whatever the matter was going on. So Louis told uh, that his aunt didn't hear uh, to anything regarding this. This thing could make her sad because she had great trust on Sturridge for almost all the things in the house. Jane but he might kill me at any moment Louis not at any moments uh, he is busy with the silver all the afternoon Jane what a frightful situation to be in with a mad butler dangling over one's head Louis of course it's only a temporary madness perhaps if you were to cut your visit short and come to us some uh, time later in the year he might have forgotten all about queen in Uh, then Jane exclaimed with fear that Sturridge uh, might kill her any time. Then Louis replied, "Not any time, as he would be busy with his cutleries throughout the afternoon. Means he would be busy in uh, kitchen." So Jane told that uh, it was a kind of frightful situation where a mad servant's always hovering around the head and might harm any time. Louis told uh, that uh, was a situational madness, and uh, he suggested a solution that if she would, uh, she could. keep her stay uh, this is stay short and later on she could again visit the ceo then it could be possible that storage might forget about the matter of queen in actually louis was just trying to uh, sure the early departure of jane from the house so he was kept making the stories and wanted to make jane believe that there was danger for her in the house Jane nothing would induce me to cut short my visit you must keep a sharp look out on Sturridge and be ready to intervene if he gets violent probably we are both exaggerating things a bit rising i must go and write some letters in the morning room mind keep an eye on the man exit door right center
Induce is called to persuade uh, and intervene means to involve. So Jane denied from any such possibility and uh, told Lois not to persuade her to uh, make her visit uh, short and she gave instructions that he must uh, keep an eye on Esteridge and uh, he should be ready to involve uh, if he would become violent. According to her, they both were unnecessarily stretching this uh, trivial matter and uh, she should um, uh, she stood up at the same time. She stood up and told that she needed to write some letters in the living room. Uh, morning room is called living room. Uh, and she reminded him to keep a watch on a storage and uh, she exited from the right door. Here we see that there was no impact of any story, any incident of Lois on Jane. And uh, instead of getting afraid, she inter instructed Lois to spy storage. Enters Mrs. Beauvisel by French window, right? Mrs. Beauvisel, can't find my gardening gloves anywhere. I suppose they are where I left them. It's a way my things have. Rummages in the drawer of table back center. They are. Produces gloves from drawer. And how is your miracle doing, Louis? Uh, rummages here means turning things up and down to search something. Uh, now, that time Mrs. Beauvisel entered from the right French window and she informed that she, uh, she was not able to find her gardening gloves anywhere. She told that uh, would be at the same place where she left uh, them last time as she always found her things in the right way, in this way. So, uh, she was turning all the things to find out uh, the gloves in the drawer and that was in the center towards the back side. Finally, she found the gloves in the drawer and uh, then she asked Lois about his miracle that he was supposed to create to uh, send Jane early from the house and he was working on that thing. Lois, rotten. I have invented all sorts of excellent reasons for stimulating the migration instinct in that woman. But, Mrs. Beauvisel, poor Lois, I'm afraid Jane's staying powers are superior to any amount of hustling that you can bring to bear. Enter storage left. He begins clearing uh, breakfast things. I could have told you from the first that you were engaged in a wild goose chase. Uh, now, rotten here means uh, uh, going worse and hustling is called forcing someone to make the decision. Stimulating is called exciting and migration instinct is called desire to go. So, Louis answered that his miracle was leading verse. Uh, he tried all kinds of fantastically planned ideas uh, for exciting the desires of Jane to leave the house, but all of no use. Mrs. Beauvisel exclaimed uh, with pitiful words for Louis and told that she was afraid as Jane's determination to stay there was superior uh, uh, than uh, the force that uh, she was having for decision making of leaving the house. Then meanwhile, Esteridge entered from left and um, uh, started to clean uh, the breakfast table. She told that she wanted to tell Lois since beginning that he was going to engage in a foolish search. Now, both Lois and Mrs. Beauvisel were thinking that to send Jane out of the house uh, before Dora's arrival was not possible. Lois, chase. You can't chase a thing that refuses to budge. Uh, one of the first conditions of the chase is that the thing you are chasing should run away. Mrs. Beauvisel laughing. That's a condition that Jane will never fulfill. Exit through window right. Lois continues cleaning golf club, then suddenly stops and looks reflectively at Sturridge, who is busy with the breakfast things. Lois, where is Miss Martlett? Reflectly, uh, reflectively is called thoughtfully and budge is called to make slightest movement. Now, Lois exclaimed with irritation that one cannot follow anyone or anything that is not ready to uh, even make a slight move. He told that if you want to follow something and uh, that first condition is that the thing should run away or at least make a slightest move. 
uh, it's not possible to chase that thing in that condition when it is not ready to move. Mrs. Beauvisel began to laugh and said that this condition for chasing something or someone could not be fulfilled by Jane. And then she uh, exited through the right window. Louis continued cleaning the golf club and suddenly he stopped cleaning and thoughtfully looked at Sturridge who was engaged in cleaning the breakfast table. Louis asked him about Jane Martlett. Sturridge, in the morning room, I believe, sir, writing letters. Lewis, you see that old basket hilted sword on the wall? Sturridge, yes, sir, this big one points to sword. Uh, basket hilted is called sword's handle. Okay, so here Sturridge replied that Jane was there in the living room and uh, might be busy in writing letters. Lewis asked him if he could uh, see the old sword. Uh, with the handle that was there on the wall. Then Sturridge answered, pointing towards the sword, if uh, that was the sword he was talking about. Lois, Miss Martlett wants to copy the inscription on its blade. I wish you would take it to her. My hands are all over oil. Sturridge, yes sir, turns to wall where sword is hanging. Lois, take it without the sheath. It will be less trouble. Inscription are the words written on the monuments and sheath is the cover of the sword. Okay, so Louis told that Jane wanted to note down the words ins inscripted on the blade of that sword. So he wanted that Sturridge took that sword uh, for Jane uh, as Louis' uh, hand were all wet in the oil and uh, he was cleaning the gold club rice. Uh, golf clubs right now. So Sturridge turned to the wall uh, where sword was hanging and Lewis told him to take the sword without its cover as it will be more convenient uh, then. Then here we can imagine that when Lewis became uh, failed to continue uh, or con to, uh, in convincing Jane with his fancy stories then he took this step to terrify Jane through Sturridge holding sword in his hand. Sturridge draws the blade uh, which is broad and bright and exits by door center. Lois is stand back under shadow of the staircase and enter Jane door right center at full run screams Lois Lois where are you and rushes upstairs at top speed. Enter Sturridge door right center sword in hand Lois steps forward. So here Sturridge took the sword out of its cover as instructed by Lois and sword was very broad and shiny. Then he went out by the center door and Lois wanted to know the proceedings. So he stood back under the shadow of the staircase. Meanwhile, Zane entered from the right door and was running and screaming. Screaming is called, uh, means uh, speaking very loud. Lois, Lois in, uh, in uh, terror. Uh, she was uh, screaming. Uh, Louis name. Where are you? And then to save herself, she rushed upstairs at the fastest speed. Then Sturridge entered from the right center door and uh, he had sword in his hand. Louis came out of the shadow of staircase. Sturridge, Miss Mutlet slipped out of the room, sir, as I came in. I don't think she saw me coming. Seemed in a bit of a hurry. Lois, perhaps she has a train to catch. Never mind, you can put the sword back. I'll copy out the inscription for her myself later. Sturridge returns the sword to its place. Lois continues uh, cleaning putter. Sturridge carries breakfast tray out by the left enter page, running full speed downstairs. Now, Sturridge told Lois that uh, when he had gone in Miss Martlett's room, then she rushed out of the room as she looked at me. It seemed as if she was in a hurry. Then Lois replied that uh, might be she had to catch a train and that's why she was in hurry. Then he told that Sturridge needed not to bother himself in that matter and Lois would himself copy down the inscription uh, written on the sword for Jane. Then Sturridge kept the sword back to its place and Lois continued with his work of cleaning the butter. Now Sturridge took the breakfast tray and uh, went out from the left door. At the same time, Paige entered there in full speed by coming downstairs. Now here Paige is a boy who um, is uh, uh, acting as an attendant of Jane Martlett. 
page, the timetable. Miss Martlet wants to look up a train. Lois dashes to the drawer of a small table center. He and Paige hunt through contents, throwing gloves, etc. on the floor. Uh, dashes is called moves very quickly. So Paige told Lois that Miss Martlet wanted to see the timetable to find the next train for herself. Lois quickly moved uh, towards the drawer of a small table capped in the center. Then Lois and Paige both started searching for the train timetable in the drawer um, and were throwing the stuffs kept in the drawers uh, like gloves and other things to search the contents. Lois, here it is. Paige sees his book and starts to run up a stair. Lois grabs him by the tip of jacket, pulls him back, opens book and searches frantically. Here you are. Leaves 11.55 arrives, cheering cross to 20. Paige dashes upstairs with timetable. Lois flies to his speaking tube in the wall left, whistles down it. Is that you, Tompkins? The car as quick as you can to catch the 11.55. Never mind your livery, just as you are. Shuts off the tube, Paige dashes downstairs. Now, here Lois found the timetable and Paige held the book and started running the upper stair. But Lois grabbed his jacket uh, collar and uh, pulled him back. And uh, uh, he himself opened the book and started searching for the next train arrival madly. Now, he found uh, and informed uh, Paige that next train would depart at 11.55 and would arrive at Cheering Cross at 2.20. Getting this news, Paige uh, rushed up a stair with the timetable. Lois quickly turns towards the speaking tube fitted in the wall towards left and prepared to speak. Now here, whistle down means send a message through is speaking. Now, a speaking tube is a kind of pipe uh, conveying a person's voice from one room to uh, or area to the another. Uh, it's a kind of device as you can see in the picture based on two uh, cones connected by an air pipe uh, through which a speech can be transmitted uh, over an extended distance. So, Lois asked uh, through the speaking tube if uh, that was Tompkins on the either side and uh, told him to take the car as he had to reach as fast as he could to catch the 1155 train with Jane Martlett. Now, here Tompkins uh, must be their driver. All right. So, he told not to bother about wearing his livery. Livery is called the particular uniform, okay, worn by the servants. So, he instructed Tompkins, the driver, who was there um, not to waste the time in wearing uh, his uniform, but be ready in whatever he was wearing at that time. He uh, put off the speaking tube then and meanwhile, Paige rushed downstairs. He asked about the golf clubs of Jane and then Louis quickly turned towards uh, the stand where golf clubs were kept and gave them to Paige. So, here we see that after seeing a with the sword in his hand, Jane was really horrified. Now, and uh, sent his attendant page to make the arrangement of quick departure from that house. This is the image how speaking tubes are attached to the walls and are used. Page Miss Martlet's golf clubs. Lois dashes for them in the stand and gives them to boy. Here, this demo center said Lois is hers, and this motorway gives them to boy. Page she said uh, there was a novel of hers down here. Lois goes to writing table where there are six books on the self, a shelf and uh, gives them all to Page. So, Page asked about Jane's uh, golf clubs. Lois rushed towards the stand and gave them to Page. Now, Tamo Center is a round fitted cloth cap, and Motor Veil means a hat with wide brim tied under the chin and had a face veil or covering that went over the hat. You must have seen in some of the episode of Tom and Jerry where Tom is in acting as a baby, then he used to wear uh, that uh, Motor Veil. Uh, after the demo center, as you can see in the picture as well. So, Lois gave some other belongings of Jane to Paige, like her demo center and her motor wheel. Then, Paige asked uh, that Jane told about one of her novels down there. So, Lois went to the writing table and gave all six books kept over the, there to Paige. Now, here we see that Jane was all sad to leave as soon as possible. 
Lewis, here take the lot. Fly. He pushes page vigorously up first step of his staircase exit page. The sound of books dropping can be heard as he goes. Lewis dashes round room to see if anything more belongings to Jane remains. Looks at his watch, compares it with the small clock on writing table, goes to speaking tube. Hello, is Tomkins there? What? Oh, all right. Shuts off the tube, goes to table where coffee pot is still remains and posts out cup of coffee drinks it looks again at watch vigorously is called with energy so firstly lois gave the book lot to page and shouted to hurry up he pushed page towards the first stair with force and page exited in that hurry page dropped some of the uh, those books as he uh, was moving up lois quickly back to the room to see if any other belonging of jane had left over there then he looked at his watch and uh, gave a quick look to the small clock kept on the writing table as well then he went to make a uh, call to Tomkins again and there was another man uh, Hullo on either side. Uh, Lewis asked him about Tomkins and then said all right as he might get the answer that Tomkins had already left. Sturridge enters left. The car has come round, sir. Lois, good. I'll go and tell Miss Martlet. Will you find my aunt? She's somewhere in the garden. And tell her that Miss Martlet had to leave in a hurry to catch the 11.55. Called away gently and couldn't stop to say goodbye. Matter of life and death. So after uh, putting down all the, the speaking tube, uh, Lewis went to the table again, uh, poured the coffee uh, for himself and looked at his watch. Same time, Mr. Rich entered from left side and informed that uh, the car had already come there. Lewis appreciated uh, and uh, told that he himself would inform Martlet about it. Then he asked Mr. Rich if he would find his aunt, Mrs. Buwissel, and instructed him to inform her about the sudden departure of Miss Martlet as uh, she has to catch the train of uh, 11.55. She was called away at the sudden or urgent basis and uh, couldn't stop for even a mo movement. Uh, then uh, uh, she has to say goodbye uh, uh, to Mrs. Bubisil, but uh, she was not having the time of even a, a moment and uh, Mrs. Bubisil uh, uh, was not present over there but, but this was a matter of life or death for Miss Martlet and that's why she was rushing without meeting Mrs. Buvisil. Storage, yes, sir. Exit is storage door left. Lois exits up a staircase. Enter Mrs. Buvisil by window right. Uh, she has a letter in her hand and uh, she looks in at door right center, returns and calls Lois, Lois. Sound of a motor hood. Lois rushes in by door left. Uh, Sturridge obeyed and exited from left door and Lois went up a stair then Mrs. Buwissel entered by right window. She had a letter in her hand and looked at the uh, door then returned and called out Lois twice. She heard the sound of going car then Lois quickly came inside by left door. Lois excitedly, how much did you say you had lent me if I got rid of Jane Martlet? Mrs. Buwissel, we needn't get rid of her. Dora has just written to say she can't come this month. Lois collapses into chair curtain. Now, Lois exclaimed with excitement and asked Mrs. Buwissel how much money she had promised to lend him if he would send Jane away. Mrs. Buwissel replied that uh, they hadn't need to get rid from Jane as Dora had just written a letter that she couldn't come this month. Listening to this, Lois fell down into the chair and uh, curtain falls means the play ends here. So the story ends uh, with no solution. How much efforts Lois had made to send Jane away from the house and now when she was out of the house that uh, remained of no use. So with this, uh, this play completed here and uh, successfully we have completed line by line explanation of this chapter and that's why i'm taking a leave now meet you next time thank you